didn't really know what was Michael on. The, there also was a show, of course, where somebody recognized or knows that Michael Long isn't really dead, and now he's Michael Knight, and now he's going to. These are great stories, but they're the obvious. But when it, we didn't really go deeper uh, it, with him, Devin, we virtually we didn't do it, and her, we didn't do it. And those really are the three main characters. We didn't go into who they were, and that bothered me a little bit because then when you invent things, for example, uh, there's a story that I tell, and so I, I won't be telling it again here, and everyone can go to on YouTube, of course, and if you just put in my name, Tom Green, G-R-E-N-E, Knight Rider speech, it's, it's where you, I think, saw me, uh, you'll see my keynote speech for a huge convention in London, and in it, because sadly, Edward Mulhair had passed away around that time, they did ask me to, to tell an Edward Mulhair story. I have another one I could tell you guys, which I absolutely love. But that's that story about the motorcycle, and if you know that. And I'm very proud of that. And with, oh, I can't hold it. Uh, Edward, as you know, was a Shakespearean actor and a Broadway actor. And he was actually sort of known also as sort of the what we call bus and truck um, Henry Higgins from My Fair Lady. Of course, um, Rex Harrison was the Henry Higgins. But what happened was is that um, Edward Mulhair uh, sort of took on the slightly, well, he did do Broadway, he did do Europe of, of Henry Higgins, and but he also did a lot of Shakespeare. He did a lot of other, other movies that go way, way back. And of course, um, most of us remember him from uh, the uh, Ghost and Mrs. Muir, you might have remembered him from that, and Our Man Flint, which was one of my favorites. I liked Edward a lot, but Edward was someone who I think felt that in some ways Knight Rider was just a little bit beneath him. And not that he didn't adore everyone on the show, and I'm not just saying this, this is, and not that he wasn't a consummate pro, but it wasn't about the show or the fact that you had a talking car or that it was television, which he had no problem doing. He felt that his job, and he was right in many cases, was basically to be the expository king. I mean, he's the guy who came in and said things like, you know, well, you know, there's a young woman and she has been kidnapped by the Venetian um, executors and uh, it's your job to find her and bring her back before the bomb blows off in Afghanistan. Uh, you will be meeting a man named, you know, and it was that kind of stuff. And it's just dull, dull, dull kinds of things. And he was getting kind of upset about that. Uh, and he had just done like four shows in a row in which his only job was to do this long expository things behind his desk and he wanted to do more. And there's a show that we did called Speed Demons. And Speed Demons was filled with a plethora of problems um, and uh, just personality problems and the fact that it actually originally it was going to be a um, spin-off. And then it was and it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't. That always has a problem. Uh, it was directed by a magnificent director who was just kind of coming back named Bruce Green, no relation to me, who I used many times after that. And I still consider he and another director named Harvey Laidman, uh, who also did Night Riders uh, and every other show I've ever done, to be probably the two best TV directors around. And poor Bruce had to deal with this show, but because it was going to be and then not and then was, then not, uh, a spinoff, it had to keep changing and changing. And, you know, a director, and Bruce was an enormously uh, prepared director. And he would go home at night and take um, uh, notes and come in in the morning, and everything he had done he'd have to throw out because we'd keep changing it. In Speed Demons, there was a scene near the end, a cute scene, because Speed Demons had to do with dirt bike racing and a... Uh, um, a murder and a possible murder and the, the, the fun of it was if you might have remembered Kit ends up on the track with the speed racers at the end but at the very end of the tag you have to do your cute scene and uh, Edward Mulhair as his character was supposed to go on a motorcycle uh, you know because uh, he mentioned something about the fact that he used to do motorcycle riding no one realized that Edward Mulhair the truth of the fact is he was absolutely and completely and totally terrified of motorcycles. Riding them, watching them, seeing them, show him a picture of one, he'd scream, but uh, he hated motorcycles, especially riding them. And he refused to ride the motorcycle. And it was imperative at the end that we have this scene where he rides off on the motorcycle. That was the whole point of the tag. And he did something which he had never done before. I think he was just upset about a lot of things. He went into his dressing room and slammed the door. And poor Bruce Green, uh, and this was actually one of the very first scenes we shot, is suddenly um, 
stuck because the actor won't come out. This is a director's nightmare, especially when a director is, is younger and, and starting out, or any director really, and that's when the actor goes in their dressing room, locks the door, won't come out, because of course time is ticking away, and at the end of the day, when you don't get the shot and you're behind schedule, they don't say, well, the actor was sitting in their dressing room pouting, they say the director's not doing their job and they can get fired. So he came to me, Bruce did, and said, is there anything you can do? So I, didn't want to go in first and several other people went in had no luck with him and I realized I had to use some psychology and I had to understand where Edward was coming from so I did something I, that I thought was interesting which is I addressed it straightforward and I think terrified the hell out of him and I think that's what worked and that was I walked in I said you know Edward I know why you're sitting here angry and I am on your side I think you should stay here and he went no. He said, yes, I, I think that what's happening right now with you is that you are wasting a great talent. It is true that you're spending all of your time doing these expository scenes. I've seen you on so many of the things, and you are so much better than that. And I, I, think, I, not, I even think not only should you sit in your dressing room, but I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do for you. I was a child actor. Not big, not like you, but I did a couple of things. And I was doing some junky little show or something in Gambier, Ohio. And I remember you were doing a road show of, of My Fair Lady and Henry Higgins. And I saw you in some small little theater doing this show, doing Higgins. I got to tell you, you're Henry Higgins. Rex Harrison is nothing. He's trash. He's garbage next to you. This is what you should be doing. You should be going from one small town to another. I know you're making big money on this show, and I know those shows you make, you know, 500 a week, whatever, but it's about the art, isn't it, Edward? It's about what you are and who you are. Not a man who sits behind a desk and tells Michael you must do this and that, but that you should be somebody who does what he believes in the hell with the money, even if you do it for free. So I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go to the tower, to the executives, right now, and I'm going to say, I think we're unfair to Edward, and I think we, we should absolutely release him from his contract. Edward looked at me. What? Are you, what? He said, yeah. I don't think you should be doing the show anymore. You're too good, Edward. You're too good to be doing this. You should be doing uh, My Fair Lady 600 performances a year all over the country in tiny little towns for 500 a week. Not here, having to come in two days a week, spew some garbage that I write or someone else writes, some junk, and getting nothing out. What, what are you making, Twenty five, fifty thousand 50000 an episode? I, what is that? That's nothing. It's not the money, Edward. I'm going to go. Well, yeah, wait a minute, he says. Oh, hold on. What do you mean? <laughs> you, you, young man, you don't need to, to get so upset about this. I just, there's a few things. I thought maybe, you know, somebody could get a double to have me shoot. Or I don't really need that. I said, no, no, Edward. It's not about that. It's more than that. You need to be, be who you are. And I started to walk out the door, and he said, oh, Tom, please, let me, let me, you can't be serious. Don't go up there. I, 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 maybe, maybe I'm being a little rash. I said, you are not being rash. You are being what you should be. And at times, you've got to stand up. I'm going there. I'm releasing you. We're going to call your agent. We're going to get you back out there on those little shows. I walked out the door. Edward comes right out and goes, Dear sir, please, have you no decency? Stop! Which, of course, I did and came back and he uh, <laughs> kind of fell back on the stairs and took his breath. And I said, are you sure? Yes, yes, it's fine, it's fine. He ran in. Within a second, he's out wearing his helmet, uh, motorcycle helmet, which he had thrown out, you know, in anger before. Goes on the set and says, oh, Bruce, young man, let's, uh, let's get this over with right now. And jumped on the motorcycle. And if you see the scene... Uh, watch it carefully, you will see that although he does the scene, he is terrified and terribly feeling uncomfortable. But that's the lovely Edward Moher, and uh, I've always been proud of that. And I will say that after that, we were very careful to give him really nice parts. If you but um, I even think I mentioned it in that, that they're back then, I think Return to Goliath, I think it was where they end up in, in jail together. He talks about how he was, you know, basically an MI1 or whatever. He was in like the secret, the James Bond secret. Yeah. Yeah. And that he has a thing and he, to get them out called Spies Bread. And he's able to take, you know, the stays of his shirt and uh, the filament and this and that. And he mixes it together and some, it becomes like a plastic explosive and they're able to blow themselves out. And he talks a little bit about his days 
when he was, you know, in, in that. And yeah, as you know, I wrote that after because for him to give him more to do. So he's not just behind the desk always saying, well, the president sort of has been kidnapped by the Indians or anything. He hated doing that. But uh, but it was wonderful because then I didn't realize it, that Edward Mulher had had experience somewhat like that. And we had lunch ones, and I was and we never got to use it. But he was telling me all these stories, and I just think it would have made the Devin character. He reminded me a little bit of years ago. There was a show called Man from Uncle. When I was a tiny kid, it was my favorite show. And Waverly something uh, was Leo G. Carroll played the Devin character. And he was the one who gave um, uh, Kiriakin and Napoleon Solo uh, their assignments. But being Leo G. Carroll, he always prefaced it by something in his past life or something he had done, which always made his character so wonderful. So that was, uh, 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 you know, something that bothered us a lot. Um, and we needed, you know, and and I think kind of superficially the show. The, and why you say, well, why did you just create it? In those days, the sad part was, if we were to have developed a backstory, let's say for Deb, the Devin character, we would have had to have sent that and submitted the, even though it's never used, the backstory to the network. And we had learned, all of us from past experience, that if you try to create a backstory of a character that's, that's currently on a show, they drive you absolutely crazy, you know, and for, for whatever reason. So, yeah, so that was, you know, that was a, a, a concern on that.